My name is Brian Jones, and I'm a teacher and an activist here in New York City. And I wanted to just say a few words of introduction here. First of all, a thank you to Riverside Church for hosting us, and of course to the campaign to end the new Jim Crow um, for hosting and, and helping to make this happen today. Our organizing committee, the people who had the vision to bring everyone together, is Sandy Jones, Jack Bryson, Lee Wengraff, Age Patterson, Harry Beresford, Reggie Bugs, C.D. Witherspoon, Lewis Webb, Tova Fry, and Five Mualim. We also have a whole list of endorsers I've been asked to read out, the Campaign to End the Death Penalty, Haymarket Books, International Action Center, Socialist Alternative, Universal Zulu Nation, the National Lawyers Guild, their New York City chapter, International Socialist Organization, Parents Against Police Brutality, and the Stop and Frisk Freedom Fighters. So thank you to all of those groups and organizations. We are attempting to bring together people who are fighting back against police brutality, violence, and murder coast to coast. Not just traversing space, but also time. We are attempting to bring together people who have been fighting for justice for their families for decades. Cases that go back into the 1990s where the parents are still fighting. And these people who, for whatever reason in their life, have decided not to give up, not to be afraid, not to submit, but to continue to fight and to continue to stand up for justice. It is these people who are the foundation and the rock upon which we have an opportunity to build this movement and actually hopefully change something important in this world. Now we know the issue of police brutality is long standing. It goes way back in America's history. There is, there is no American history that does not include racist violence. From the very beginnings of this country, violence and racism have gone together. Now we have a situation where in 2013, with a black president, with a black attorney general, the top cop, where this new Jim Crow has not let up one iota. If anything, in New York City, it feels like they're turning it up. In some ways, uh, I expect that that might be a reaction to our movement, to the fact that we've pushed this issue into the headlines, made them answer for stop and frisk. The reason that, that stop and frisk is on trial right now in the courts is because this movement put stop and frisk on trial in the streets. That is what's going on in New York City today. We're gonna hear from somebody named Mark Clements. You're gonna hear his story, but there's another name you need to know that I don't want to say everything about his story, but um, you need to know the name of John Burge. Because John Burge went to Vietnam and learned how to torture people, came back and rose in the ranks of the Chicago Police Department and became a lieutenant. And under John Burge, countless young people, I think nearly all African American men, were tortured as policy in the Chicago Police Department. The torture led to confessions, naturally, and on the basis of those confessions, a whole bunch of people, not just John Birch, but a whole bunch of people, rose in the ranks. Part of the thing I think we're confronting with in this movement is the fact that we are up against a system where there are people in this system who have an interest in making their money, making their careers, on the bones of other people, literally. But Mark has fought back. Mark, as a juvenile, was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. As a juvenile. And yet he's still here and still standing. Please welcome Mark Clements. Not for something that I did do, for something I did not do. Our criminal justice system is corrupt. It's corrupt to the core. That's one of the reasons why each of you are here. We're looking for a solution to the problem. Uh, being 16 years of age, going through the criminal justice system represented by 
two public defenders, one with one year of experience, the other one with two years of experience. Uh, I was tried off of, of a confession alone. That was the only evidence, not a witness or anything else to uh, contribute to the conviction other than the confession. We have suffered. And the young lady here, listening to her story, it's mind-blowing that there's no accountability for prosecutors in this country and there's no accountability for police in this country. Uh, I have just recently made a decision uh, in the skirts of Chicago to run for Illinois State Senate. My platform is a unwinnable platform, but it is a platform that will give you a voice if you want that opportunity. Today I work for the campaign to end the death penalty, where that now we see men on death row such as Rodney Reed. Me being chained to a wall inside of an interrogation room called nigger and little nigger boy so many times that that's what I thought my name was. I had a African American judge. It was just one thing. He was blind to the fact that there were many African-American men and women, I did say it right, women, walking inside his courtroom who looked like mummies. These individuals had been tortured in the worst way imaginable with electrical shock boxes. Some of them had objects stuck either in their rectums or else in other body areas. Still today, John Burge and his subordinates still have never been held accountable for the tortures. John Burge is concurrently in prison, will be getting out of prison in February for perjury and obstruction of justice. This auditorium, yes, it should be filled, but activism is this. If it's only one person in here who I'm speaking to, long as he's a doer, then I have got my message across. We're dealing with mass incarceration, mass incarceration of young children that are told that they are unworthy to ever amount to anything in their lives. Because when you sentence someone to natural life, then therefore you're saying that they are unworthy to ever be productive citizens in society. I disagree. I disagree not only with Illinois legislators, but with legislators all over this thinking country. It's wrong, it's bogus, and it must stop. I am never a person that is in position to say that a kid as young as 13 and 14 years of age will never amount to anything. I was called a monster. I was called two different individuals. As a kid, I sucked it up because I was a kid. That means I didn't understand the real responsibility of being handed four natural life sentences and told you will never get out of prison. But one thing that I did do, I fought back. And as some of you may look at this room, I didn't even have this amount of people. I had one person, a mother, 
That's all I had. Do you know where my mother at now today? She's dead. She's dead because she fought to get me out of prison. That's one thing that we must understand. As I stand here before you today, I don't stand here and represent myself. As I travel around this country and speak, I don't speak just for myself, but I speak for my moms. Due to the fact if there was not a Virginia Clemens, Mark Clemens be still in prison. It's all about making connections when you are locked up. And if you have no one on the outside, you remain to suffer from your plight. But briefly, to give you a overall picture of what I endured as a kid, imagine being shackled to two rings and having your testicles and genitals grabbed and squeezed. Now I come in front of a judge and I'm told if you didn't commit the crime, why did you confess? How much common sense does that make? Our kids don't trust us because we're liars. We're double talkers. We're not doers. We did not protect them. I have four grandkids. That's who I fight for today, to give them an opportunity, to keep them out of the system. In the state of Illinois, they know, don't mess with my kids. That's all I have. Looking at the Bruford's for the second time and other people in this room, they may never understand that I understand their pain. I've been there, I've done that. People ask me, after serving 28 years in prison and getting out of prison, why would you wish to get involved and to deal with prison issues? It's due to the fact that these are human beings. And if we don't give them an opportunity, guess what? Guess who's gonna get the backlash? All of us. If I take your food stamps and I don't feed you after you have done all this time in prison, wh where that person's gonna end up at? Back in prison. If I don't give him a job, then where is he gonna end up at? Sex offenders. Yes, they did wrong, but should they be held accountable for the rest of their lives? Not able to get a job, not able to have food stamps, not able to live in certain housing. You might as well keep them locked up. So to these so-called honest, crooked toe politicians, Someone needs to stand before them and let them know. Listen here, I can't beat you because you're a better liar than I am. But I can embarrass you all day long before the media. That's where our fight comes in at when it deals with crooked prison officials that have people condemned inside of prisons and suffering. Those men are locked behind cages. Their best is coming out to a prison yard or calling you and wasting 12 and 13 dollars to talk to you for 30 minutes. It's robbing the poor. I say that it must stop. I'm behind jazz. I'm behind New York. And I say right now, we must fight back. Thank you. Our next speaker is from Portland, Oregon. In 2010, May 12th, Fred Bryant's son, Keaton Otis, was murdered by the Portland police. Please give Fred Bryant a round of applause. Welcome up. It never gets any easier. It, it never gets any easier. Thank you, Sandra, for you know, 
having me come out. I haven't been asleep since Thursday. Last month, you know, it was three years uh, since my son was killed. And the same thing that's happening all around the country is the same thing that's happening else places and, and, and you know, our little city of roses is not such a city of roses. Um, you know, I have 11 grandchildren and two more older boys, well, young men. <sighs> the day my son was killed, I was sitting at home with my, with my youngest daughter and we were watching TV and the news, the news came on and they were, they were showing that, you know, this was this shooting. The police, this, they shot somebody else again. And so we're just sitting there and I'm like, when they said how many times they shot and then how many times this person was hit, I was like, oh my God, what, you know, what, did it really take all that? Unbeknownst to me, not knowing it was my son that was on the other end of them bullets. Well, of course, I didn't find that out for five days later. You know, I was born and raised in Portland. You know, you know, um, when when the cops were officer friendly, they knew everybody in the neighborhood. They didn't know you because they took you to jail. You know, they knew you because they they were community police. And what we have today in the city of Roses is a bunch of cops that come back from Afghanistan, Iraq, and, and all these other third world countries, and, and, and they're traumatized, and, and they come into the city, and, and, and they, they, they're still running around with this, this, this mental thing in their head, and, and they terrorize everybody in the community. The police tried to stay away from me, is what they did. They, they didn't want to come talk to me. They didn't want nothing. I had to find them. And when I showed up on their doorstep, they knew they had to do something. <coughs> you know, I, I truly believe in God because everything that was put in my life, it, 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 was, it was like uh, uh, evidence and, and stuff they tried to get rid of. They literally tried to get rid of. And all these things fell on my lap, you know. Um, you know, they shot, they shot at my son 32 times and they hit him 23 from point blank range. One officer emptied his clip. And when they asked him, why were you going to reload your gun? He said he didn't want to be caught without any bullets. Well, they claimed that my son had shot first. Well, he didn't. And, 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 and to this day right now, you know, I fight for my appeal rights. Um, I'm very angry. You know, I'm very angry. I'm, I, I never thought it would come to my doorstep. None of us do. Mm. None of us do. We That's don't right. raise our kids to think that we got to bury them. Mm -hmm. I'm freaking angry, man. But I know God said vengeance is not mine. Because see, they'll just put me in jail. You know, um, um, oh, man, I, I, you know, my mission is, is that, you know, I, I'll never give because I got to protect my grandchildren. I got to protect my other boys. See, because they profile big time. Mm -hmm. They profile. Yeah. Now they come talking about economic profiling. So if you're driving a raggedy car, you liable to get stopped. Mm -hmm. <coughs> you know, they tortured my son. They hunted him down while he was driving down the street minding his own business and he had a hoodie on. Who don't wear a hoodie? You can't tell nobody who to, what, what to wear. 
And when they stopped my son, they immediately attacked him. They started beating on him, and then they tased him too. He was almost dead to the side of his head would look like a softball. And then, out of the blue, you hear, let's do it. And that was it. That's what they left me with. The crying has, has, has lessened, and the anger has got more. And my anger just makes me keep pushing forward, because I stay in their face. I ain't scared of them. Po Chief of police, mayor, all of them. I keep showing up. Because that's my job. That was my baby. I don't know, you know, I, I, I'm really tired. I'm just really tired. You know, and, and but I keep moving. I keep pushing forward. No matter what, I keep pushing forward. These cops are out of control. And they're not held accountable for nothing. Nothing. Everybody that has been shot in the last five, six, seven years in Portland, Oregon, has had a right to appeal their case except me. Mm -hmm. Except me. Because I know what they did. Because it's not what you know, it's what you can prove in their eyes. And what I can prove is they don't want me to prove it. My son has a website, Justice for Keaton Notice. You can go to that website. There's links, the, the, the transcripts, everything is there. You know, and, and so, you know, and, and that's because a lot of people coming together take it up what I couldn't do because I could have never done it. Never. So we do, we got to come together from coast to coast, corner to corner. It don't make no difference because we all family right now, man. Because like the man said, they, the servants, no, they don't get to sit at the table with us and decide. You get to do what we tell you to do. We pay you. So anyway, I, I, like back at home, I, I'm, I'm, I'm long-winded. I just, in anything I talk about, you know, they ringing little bells and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> but I want to say thank you for, for, for having me here. And, and, and I'll, I'll be back. I'll be around. Do the internet thing. Mm. Thank you. Uh. Thank you, Fred, for sharing that story. I can't imagine how hard it is to talk about that. There are so many families going through this. I don't, I don't even know the national statistics. Just before we started, Juanita Young shared with me a document she has that shows the names and faces of all of the people killed in New York City by the police since the murder of Amadou Diallo in 1999. And the number of people that Juanita showed me was 230 have been killed in that time. Last year, it was 20 were murdered last year. And already this year, four by my count. Next up, we're gonna hear from a brother from Philadelphia, Abdus Sabur. His son, Askia, was brutalized by the police. September the 3rd, 2010, my son, Askia Sabor, was terrorized by the Philadelphia Police Department. Of course, there was one officer in particular, but all of them are at fault. I don't know about you people, but they got a thing that they call guilt by association. Are you familiar with it? Okay, so they all are guilty. And they all need to be evaluated for their mental problem that they're having. I'm a product of the same crap. So it didn't just start yesterday. 
It's been going on for years. How is it? Black, white, or candy stripe, it don't make no difference. You are brutal, brutalized by the people who are supposed to serve you. You know I'm trying to hold myself, you know, but ass is not a, that's an animal, right? But they whip your ass. Do you understand? You better wake up because they're at your door <laughs> right now. You need to get your children involved so that they can know their rights. Sometimes some of us want to, we want to stand up and argue with a rabid dog while he will bite you. <laughs> you don't want to argue with him. You want to get the veterinarian and have the veterinarian take care of him, but we don't have a veterinarian to serve cops. So a people movement has to come from out of all of this where they will stand up and do something. If a cop do something wrong, he should be charged accordingly, lose his job, lose his pension, lose everything. How is he going to say that he's afraid his life was threatened by a young man standing in front of a daggone <laughs> Chinese store trying to get some food for his mother, just talking to his cousin in his neighborhood, and the cops don't even live there, that beat up my son. Talking. Just general conversation. They drove around the corner after they saw my son. Yes, they're marked. All of our children are marked, including yours. Your son don't have to say nothing. He's guilty by association. Congress is guilty by association. The Senate is guilty by association. All these so-called political leaders are guilty by association because we're catching the hell while they're doing well. He had to get six staples in his head. By the grace of God, they didn't fracture his skull, but I should have brought one of those daggone uh, metal sticks that they have, and he was <laughs> cracking my son upside the head. Each and every way. From the neck up is a red line area. You're not supposed to do it. They know the law, but they don't use the law to benefit the civilians. They use the law to, to benefit themselves. And they say that they were fearing for their lives. Kadir, Marie, stand up. You ain't got to be paranoid about none of that because there's more of y'all that belong to me. Some they know and some they don't know. But you're marked. Those are my two sons, 17 and 19 years old. They didn't come here because they wanted to. They came here because I asked them. And for that, I'm grateful. Because I want them to understand what they are up against. And their associates are on the same level. And they talk about these very same things that we're talking about now. I still would have loved to have been here. But he's healing now. He's trying to get himself together and deal with his children that he hasn't seen for two and a half years. But Dad Nabbit, I'm not going to sit back on the sideline because my son can't come. I'm going to come. And the responsibility, I got five minutes. I'm going to use them well. The responsibility is on each and every one of us. We are a community of people, and we have to join together. Regardless of what state you live in, we all have the same problems, the same issues. I've been all over this daggone United States and I've seen people in the same wretched condition. And the politicians are still having the gravy over their potatoes and whatnot, eating good and 
looking at the great big screen TV, I mean, going to the best parties and stuff, you're not invited, but your tax dollars pay for it. If they were to take a little less and do a little more, I wouldn't say nothing. But they take everything, even our children's lives. This thing is really a bridge for us all to cross over on and come together. They separate us. They say the Puerto Rican community and this community and that community. We are one damn community. We're the human community. We're coming up on the one year anniversary of one of the most brutal and outrageous murders, police murders in this city. In June of 2012, a woman by the name of Chantel Davis was chased. A police officer approached her car, reached into her, opened the door, reached into the car, murdered her in the car, dragged her out of the car, and then with at least 100 people looking on, mm. left her to die on the street. Mm. I mean, one of the most outrageous, brutal, disgusting murders we've seen. Amazingly, her family came out swinging. Mm. I went to, yes. I remember going to one of the protests that they organized almost immediately to the precinct. They marched through Brooklyn and then they said, we're going to march again next week and we're going to march the week after that. And they formed an organizing committee. There's a new thing that's happening in this city, I think, where people are beginning to figure out that we cannot fight back against this kind of police murder, violence, terrorism alone. We have to figure out ways to form organizations. We have to increasingly work together. And one of the families that's been leading that fight is the family of Chantel Davis. So please welcome Natasha Davis here to share her story. When my sister was murdered, I think the first, the reason why our family decided to fight back or, you know, whatever you want to call it, take a stance or whatever was because the first thing the media did was say that she was arrested six times and that she was some mastermind criminal or something like that. And my sister, was, she was never convicted of any crimes. Um, we read in the, in, the, in the newspaper, we read that Detective Atkins, which they call Bad Boy Atkins in my neighborhood, that um, he reached in the vehicle and his gun discharged. If his gun discharged, that means that he didn't mean to shoot her. It was an accident. That was never mentioned. Police never said anything, came to us and said anything. This detective in my neighborhood, like I just said, is Bad Boy Atkins. Has anybody seen Denzel Washington in Training Day? That's Bad Boy Atkins. Exactly. Exactly. He has, I, I think it was four or five um, civil lawsuits against him. The city paid out two or three of them already. He shouldn't have been on the street, but he was. Forming the committee, when we formed the committee, it was because we had to get our own witnesses. Mm -hmm. DA or whoever else, lawyers or whoever else, nobody really wanted to touch the case. Although it was four, four or five o'clock in the afternoon and tons of people were outside. On my, in my neighborhood, it was on a busy street, Church Avenue, where we have these van, dollar cabs that run up and down. It was June afternoon, very, very high traffic area. And we had to form a committee. We had to canvas the area ourselves because that same night, what they did, they took every single camera from all the stores around mm. because they got one up on us months, pri months before in the Bronx, Ramali Graham was killed in his home. What saved them, they didn't know that they had a camera out front, so they weren't able to take that camera. When it came down to my sister's case, they got smart. 
and they took seven cameras from, the, from all the stores in the neighborhood. So we don't know what happened. I only know what the witnesses said. And according to the witnesses, there was no chase. One of those same dollar cabs that stopped, stopped in the middle of the street and she went around and tried to turn and a, a, a van was coming in the opposite direction that she was trying to avoid from hitting and crashing into the vehicle. And before you knew it, the cops were up on her. People heard her saying, what, 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 they always don't shoot or I can't get out because the airbags had exploded. She couldn't go anywhere. So what was he doing in her vehicle trying to pull her out? One shot in the chest. And then left her on the floor, face down, to bleed out. My sister went to the morgue that night as a Jane Doe. Because this happened at 4.30, 5 o'clock in the afternoon, and no one came to tell us until after 10 o'clock that night. I lived three blocks away from where it happened. And I saw the bus turning off and people calling me, hey, what's going on over there by you? I was like, I don't know, I just got inside. They saying some woman was killed, 30 years old. I was like, oh my God, what's going on? I don't, even, I don't, I don't know anybody, I know I'm, I'm right here. Who I know that's 30? I had no idea that it was my sister who had already went to the hospital or the morgue, I should say, and by the time we got to the hospital, they wouldn't let us see her. We had to come back the next day to identify the body. Before we started to protest and march weekly, the community did stand up and they did the first, they did the first march that night and they went to the precinct and then we followed shortly after. I would say about seven months in, I slowed down. We slowed up with the marches because we wanted to go a different route. We tried to plan something different and we slowed up. Nine months in, it, this happens again. On the same strip, less than a mile away, Kamani was killed. And every day I ask myself, like, if we, was, if we would have kept marching or kept protesting, maybe the same narcotics team or whatever would have thought twice about how they approached the 16-year-old. I never got a chance to apologize to Carol or the Gray family because sometimes I just think that we should have been still protesting because, you know, Kamani, my son is 16, Kamani and my son knew each other. They used to play basketball at, in the park. And it's the same Brooklyn South team, the same officers. They have civil suits. The city has paid out on these suits already. So we, we're here now, you know, families are, are from, you know, coast, east coast, west coast, we're, we're uniting now. But I, I, I already feel burnt out. This is like 11 months in. I just heard yesterday that the DA basically like, um, they can't do anything with the case because the witnesses don't, they don't have any more of the witnesses that we found. So now we have to go back again. And nobody wants to speak. All those hundreds of people that were outside who, t who came to me personally and said, you know, your sister wasn't doing anything, it wasn't no chase. So sometimes I feel like it's a waste of time. A couple weeks ago, remember a couple weeks ago, in the Bronx with the Graham case, when we, when we found out there was an indictment. For every of, the, of those court cases, I mean, Constance and Frank, they're not gonna say it, or whatever, I'm gonna say it. I was angry that we didn't shut down 161st Street just by people, alone. Yeah, there was a hand, there was a good amount of people out there, but there should have been way more. There should have been way more. And then maybe that, that stupid ass judge would have thought twice than to talk about there's some discrepancy in what the DA, some wording or some nonsense. We in a church, so sorry. 
You understand what I'm saying? The last, the last court hearing, you know, and I see when I, I, I just met Constance a year ago. And when I see her break down, I, I couldn't do anything for her. And now she has to start over again. I'm, I don't call myself an activist. I'm not an activist. My sister was killed. I want to do things different in my community. I want to help. I want this to stop. <laughs> There's well-seasoned activists in this room. And we can't just keep having all activists come together in a room. Forget about that. That's nonsense now. Instead of me marching in my, in, on Flatbush or Church Avenue, we need to be marching on 42nd Street where they're making money. We need to be marching in Times Square, 34th Street. Thank you, Natasha. Next up, we're going to hear from Suzette Cook, who's coming from Providence, Rhode Island. Her son, Joshua, was, was brutalized by the police in March of this year. My son, Joshua, was... Um was terrorized against on March 5th of 2013. For my son to be only four foot 10 and not even a 115, maybe 20 pounds, if that, were beat by at least five or more officers which standing well over six feet tall and my son didn't have any guns, no drugs, no weapons. This was just a basic routine traffic stop. And so for that, you would have thought, okay, let him get a ticket, send him on his way. But this officer decided as they do with the racial profiling that he wants to, well, according to the police reports, they want to say that my son was a gang member, but on their their site for what gang? He was in a gang by himself. Um, and even in the event that if he had, if they didn't give them the right to do what they did to my kid. And what they've done is, I'm sorry to hear about a lot of the, the parents here that are the siblings that have lost their family members and they're no longer with us. And, and, and in one moment, I wanna say that I have some gratitude that I can see my son, but what this does is that this will affect him for the rest of his life. When, uh, when talking with Joshua, needless, let me go back because my son is incarcerated right now. And what they tried to say is, is that my son had some type of hu superhuman strength. Mm. And that he, the, the reasoning behind their behavior, what they did to him, was that, um, he assaulted one of them. My son, needless to say, was dragged, kicked, choked, spit on, insulted. And um, it's hard for me to rewind this tape, but my, you know, according to my, my kid, he says, Ma, you know, like, They've charged me with resisting arrest and, and all of these various different things that I did not do. Um, and he says, you know, like, I'm scared to be here. Well, needless to say, Joshua comes home in, in a couple more days. They gave him 90 days on, on a violation. But he says, I'm, I don't like being here, but I'm also scared to come home. Mm. In a place in which that we live in, nobody never does anything. It's a small community. And so I made the decision when he told me, he says, Ma, you know, they said that there's no need for me to say anything because there's nothing going to happen. They says that I'm the gang, but they're the ones that's the gang. Um, and, I, and he said that they told him that there was no need to say anything because there wasn't nothing going to happen. Well, those were the wrong things to say to that kid because they messed with the wrong woman's child today. I don't know about other people out there in that community, but what I say to them is, is that because no one stands up to these officers, I will, because I don't have any fear but God. I look at it this way, that I'm not out just fighting for my son. I'm fighting for other women's children as Come well, on. because it could be their uncles, their brothers, their sisters, their fathers. 
And it's, it's difficult because I felt as though that I was fighting this battle alone. Um, and I made the decision and I put my son's picture on Facebook because I went to my NAACP, I went to the Urban Leagues, the just anything and everybody, and I couldn't get no help. So when I put my son's, on, son's picture on Facebook, within a matter of less than like three days, it went from 30 something people to a little over 500 and something supporters that came up from across the country. Mm -hmm. And I got a gentleman by the name of like Terrence Jones that has come out, but it's hard when you, I can see that I'm not no longer alone. Because at that moment, I felt like I was fighting this cause by myself. Mm -hmm. I, um, I won't stop fighting. I will die fighting all right. for all of our children, not just my son. I, um, I'm kind of sweating to death now, and I really don't like to cry. But I, I just wanted to thank you, Sandra, for inviting me here. I'd like to thank um, the lady, I don't see her, Ms. Buford, um, a lot of these people that came out and, and support of, um, or just have given me support and, 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 uh, and helping me with my son, because I don't know like where I'll go from here, but I know that if I had to go across the country to bring acknowledgement to what is going on in that, in that small community in which that I live in that state, then that's just what I'll do. Um, thanks for having me here. Thank you, Suzette. Last on, our, uh, on the first of our panels here, um, well, let me just, before I introduce our last speaker for this panel, let me just remind people who came in a little bit late of the structure here. After, um, we, after we finish up with this panel, if time allows, we'll have, do you, will we have time for discussion, do you know? Okay, we'll see how we go. Um, but either way, discussion or no, if, time, if we have time, there's going to be another panel um, that's going to talk about really the issue that Natasha raised about our strategy and how it is that we can go forward and build this movement. And then at the end of the day, there's a kind of cultural presentation uh, coming up, so please stick around for that. Right now, I also want to say that there's a box that's going around um, where you can support this work. Obviously, there were many plane tickets purchased um, and in addition to renting this hall. So if you can support in any way um, the effort to make this event happen, we would greatly appreciate it. Um, that box is going around. Our last speaker, Danette Chavis, lost her son, Gregory Chavis, in 2004. And over the years, I've known Danette for a while now, and over the years, um, every time I hear Danette speak, she reminds me of how important it is to knit these families together and to build a movement of the people who are willing to come out and speak out and fight. Like um, previous speakers have said, nobody chooses this. This is what's thrust upon them. But one of the people, one of the things you see is that people who decide that they are gonna keep on fighting, that they are going to figure out a way to protest, to push back, to stand up, is that it changes you over time. And to me, one of the, I don't know if Danette Chavis calls herself an activist or not, it's, I don't know, maybe she'll say. But to me, whether, whatever you call her, she's one of the most important fighters out here, standing up, telling the truth fearlessly, <laughs> year after year. Please give a warm welcome to Danette Chavis. Good afternoon. Um, before I speak to you, I have a message to each and every family here who has lost a loved one and people who have been brutalized at the hands of police. In November of 2006, a young man by the name of Sean Bell was shot at 50 times, and his mother, Valerie Bell, who intended on being here, was unable. So she sent me a message, and she wants to read it to each, she wants me to read it to each and every one of you as a word of encouragement. 
and she says the following, I know words can't bring back our loved ones we have lost through a senseless death. When I received the call on November 25th, 2006 about my son, Sean Elijah Bell, being in an accident, the first thought came to mind was a car accident, not the NYPD shooting at the car 50 times. Then I thought to myself, the NYPD was supposed to be here to protect us. Then these words came in my mind, purpose and plan. Being a Christian, I knew God had a purpose and a plan for all of us here today. According to the 8th chapter, 28th verse in Romans, it says the following, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Yes, I know it's not easy to have lost a loved one, especially if the loved one is a child, even though we are all going to pass away one day. But the most hurting part is how we passed away, being young and being killed by the NYPD. I know it might sound like our loved ones were killed on purpose or it was planned. Please don't think that way. I feel in my heart that we are here today for a purpose and a plan. A purpose to plan a project in hope of making a change in the world when it comes to police brutality. A purpose and a plan to have faith and hope that one day a police officer would do the time for their crime. Even though it will be seven years for the death of my son, I still cry out. And for some of us, it has been even longer. Let's cry out today and stand together in unity to go forth with a purpose and plan for our loved ones to get some kind of justice. As Martin Luther King said, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter to us. Just remember our loved ones are smiling down on us when they see us working in favor of their name. When you are feeling down, just look at the picture of your loved one. It's okay to cry, but remember to smile because in your heart, you carry the fond memories of them. This is what I call my Sean moment. Blessings and love from Mrs. Valerie Bell. Well, my position concerning police brutality is that national action needs to be taken. I'm happy that people were able to come from different parts of the United States to partake of this because clearly something needs to be done. We are living in a time, although many of us, including like Ms. Bell, who referred to comments of Martin Luther King and others refer to com comments on Malcolm X, etc., we are living in a very different time. We are seeing some of the racism and some of the police brutality that occurred in the 60s, but the situation is different today because our rights are being not just violated, but taken. Attorneys defending people are being incarcerated. People are being spied upon. Your sons and daughters are not only being stopped and frisked while they're in the street, they have police in their schools arresting them simply because they didn't have school ID. If that doesn't tell you the climate that we're living in, I don't know what will. I think that it's utterly ridiculous to do the same things over and over and get results which are no results at all and still continue on marching and protesting, begging individuals to do the right thing when clearly they have showed you that is not their intention. When a family member loses their life to police brutality, we are made to march and plead and beg for justice because justice is denied us. So we must go that route. However, that cannot be the cure-all in regards to justice. There must be an overall fight 
that is focused at the top at this very government itself concerning the so-called alleged rights of liberty and justice and freedom for all. Because as I look, our liberty is being taken away. We have thousands and thousands of people who are incarcerated when there exists evidence that shows their innocence, yet they refuse to release them. We have thousands of people who have been incarcerated under a biased drug law, okay, and they're still in jail. Okay, thousands, where is their liberty? Their liberty has been taken away. Okay, as far as justice, we have to beg and march and plead for it. There's no reason whatsoever why if you live in a so-called United States and you have rights and privileges that you have to march and beg and plead for them to do the right thing. But when the table is turned and you are accused of a crime, within 72 hours you will be charged, you will be brought before the judge, and you will be issued a sentence. But when the police kill our children, we are made to wait until they investigate it. Right. Investigating can go on three, four, two months, whenever they get good and ready to get back to you. And the officer will still be on the job, still receiving pay, and you're left to grieve and wonder what happened. I know families who lost loved ones due to police brutality to this day have never been told the reason why police killed their child. You go on a runaround trying to find out why is my child dead. Right, right. This ought not be. You have a commissioner here in New York City who no matter what the officers does, they defend them. We witnessed here in this city, in the Ramali Graham case, when the officer went for his arraignment, paid his bail, was released, he came out on the street to the applause of his entire department. This is a man that busted into a house illegally, without permission, without a warrant, killed an unarmed 18-year-old in his own home, and when he gets arraigned, they're applauding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what they Where's their sense of justice? Where's the sense of official uh, righteousness, even from the commissioner? How could you have an officer even on your watch that could violate departmental, departmental policies, the laws of the land, kill a man in the process, and he still works for you? Mm. So clearly, they don't have a problem with the actions of their officers. And I'm sick and tired of begging them to do what they have clearly shown they have no intentions on doing. And that is the reason why I created the petition demanding national action against police brutality because accountability for law enforcement across the United States is non-existent. You hear what I'm saying? It don't exist. Whatever they say it was, that's what it was. A police officer in the United States is the only individual that can kill you, okay, and his testimony is considered as valid That's as right. for what he did. If I kill somebody, I'm under scrutiny. They're not going to take my testimony because whatever I say, quite naturally, is going to be in defense of myself because I'm not trying to go to jail. So quite naturally, whatever I tell you is the reason it's going to be in my favor so that there's no guilt found in me. A police officer is the only one who has the capacity to do that. Kill you and say, this is why I did it. And be considered justified. And to add insult to injury, the reasons given don't even have to make sense. Just as long as the mouth is talking, just as long as they say something, anything, they will be considered justified. How do you expect me to rely on a law enforcement agency when the majority of them, when they kill a man, their bitch ass justification is, I thought he had a gun. I was in fear of my life. Well, if you got two guns on your hips, handcuffs, the whole department backing you, and you still scared, imagining that you're seeing things, maybe you don't need to be an officer. Right. Maybe you're in the wrong job. Maybe they need to change your job description because you are not qualified for the position given. The Attorney General of the United States, Eric Holder, is the chief law enforcer. That means it is his responsibility, his sworn duty, to take actions against officials, whether on the government level or on the state level, who violate the law. Right. 
Law enforcement has violated the law coming and going. Right. The department heads refuse to pro prosecute them. The district attorneys refuse to bring charges against them. And the state attorneys act like we don't see none of that y'all handling. <laughs> so therefore, the bulk of the matter falls on the United States Attorney General because he oversees all of those entities. And if they ain't doing what the hell they supposed to do, hello, you'll move. That's what the petition is about. It's about galvanizing people across the United States to focus on this government and tell them, get off your do-nothingness and deal with this issue. If the President of the United States can get on national TV and focus on 24 white babies who lost their lives and create such a stir that they want to change the Constitution and they want to change policies, then goddamn it, thousands and thousands of black and brown folks being slayed every day by law enforcement is certainly worthy of your attention. Law enforcement has violated the law coming and going. Right. The department heads refuse to prosecute them. The district attorneys refuse to bring charges against them. And the state attorneys act like we don't see none of that y'all handling. <laughs> so therefore, the bulk of the matter falls on the United States Attorney General because he oversees all of those entities. And if they ain't doing what the hell they supposed to do, hello, you'll move. That's what the petition is about. It's about galvanizing people across the United States to focus on this government and tell them, get off your do-nothingness and deal with this issue. If the President of the United States can get on national TV and focus on 24 white babies who lost their lives and create such a stir that they want to change the Constitution and they want to change policies, then goddamn it, thousands and thousands of black and brown folks being slayed every day by law enforcement is certainly worthy of your attention. Yeah, 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 yeah. We are tired yeah. of you pretending that we don't exist. Mm -hmm. It's bad enough we losing our houses, can't get a job, can't get no services, no programs, and they slaying us across the United States, and you smiling and grinning, uh oh no, game up, we coming for you, expect us. Yeah. I'm hearing that Two members of Kamani Gray's family would like to speak, Carol and Molly. Good day. Thank you for having us here today. It took a while for me to get up here. It was actually my first day, you know, trying to dress up since I lost my son because I lost all hopes of looking good, feeling good or even smelling good. My brother over here from Oregon, when you speak just now, um, I really wanted to get out my seat and come and hold you because you were sharing my home pain with me. And the speaker right here that says, all the officers are guilty by association. I could feel what you're saying because I know police officers my sister right there that comes here with me, her sister is a police officer. So I know that they are human beings like us. And we do have the term where people say you have good cop and bad cop. But I have to agree with you. They're all guilty by association. Mm -hmm. all right. I made a remark several weeks ago about white supremacists. And I was terrorized about it. When I said terrorized, I mean, no one called me up about it, but I heard the slanders out there. But when my son's life was taken, the newspaper, the newspaper headline was gang member Kimani Gray, not teenager Kimani Gray. So if I say white supremacist, I'm trying to show who I'm dealing with. So if you're going to describe my son, you're supposed to say 16-year-old Kimani Jabari Gray was killed while standing in front of his friend's gate. Mm. Mind his own business. Today is actually two months and 22 days 
since I lost Kimani. It feels like two minutes soon as I hear another parent get up and speak because that pain never goes anywhere. It doesn't matter if it's three years, five years, or 10 years. Your children belong to you and they're supposed to stay with you until God wants them back. Until they bury you, not you burying them. It's hard getting up in the mornings. It's hard going to sleep at night. Mornings are bad for me on school days because I used to have to wake Kimani up, you know. At night, I usually call Kimani to remind him about the hour for curfew. And it's so funny. I didn't get to discipline Kimani that night because it wasn't past his curfew time. They killed my son way before his curfew. Today, I want to say um, to Chantel's sister, you don't have to apologize to me for not marching. There's no way you could have known because after what happened to your sister, I figured you had some type of hope. You were looking for some type of hope. Because with me, I think after they kill Amadou and Sean, I thought there was supposed to be some type of retraining for these officers. Like to say, okay, how many more mistakes are we going to make? You know, come on, these people are dying out here. Someone has to get up and speak for us. The white people, as I say once again, let me clarify, I'm not prejudiced. I love all nations. But the white people that live in the ICE society need to stop trying to be so politically incorrect. Stop trying to be so politically correct and let their children know that these are people. We have the same blood. We are all of God. You know, black people is not because they're black they get in trouble. It's been from the olden days we've been suffering. And it's time for us to stand up and fight for ourselves. No one is going to help us until we help ourselves. And I'm willing, and I'm going for it with you, to the hand, and you, to the hand, to fight for Kimani, and Romali, and your son, sir, from Oregon, and your son, miss, and Chantel. If I'm sick, I'll find a way. We have to do something. We cannot just keep crying. And keep it to ourselves we gotta let the world know i got phone calls from parts of the world i don't even know these people calling me about kimani how could so much people be affected for a 16 year old boy kimani had a lot of dreams kimani wanted me to be proud of him but I couldn't change Kimani from being a teenager. We all were teenagers. Some of us slide by easily and some of us, you know, took it around the curb. But Kimani was just growing up in the community that I bring him from the hospital and raise him in. No gang affiliation. No gang don't tell me when to make the refrigerator be full. No gang don't buy the garments and Kimani back. Kimani answers to no one but me. So when they put it out there, they say Kimani is gang affiliated. Hey, I couldn't have a curfew. You know, they just take away all my dreams. Everything that I hoped for for Kimani, I wanted was to see what his kids was going to look like. The type of job he's going to hold down. And even to wonder if Kimani will be the one to bury me. But instead, I bury Kimani. When I got the phone call that Kimani was shot by the police, it didn't touch me at first because I said, no, nah, Kimani has no reason to be shot by the police. Because when I watch the news many times, people that have been shot by the police is supposed to be serial killers. 
you know, people caught up in a bank robbery, people got caught on a murder scene, you know. Not even to be a drug dealer is supposed to be shot. Everyone is allowed to be proven, you know, guilty or not in the courts. I know that Kimani could have been arrest been arrested for what I don't know because I wasn't there. But the son that I know and the son that I have would never point a gun at a police officer. All I'm saying today is this, we as mothers are the only one that feels the pain. And as this lady right here said, our son is locked up in jail, but he's scared to come out. Hey, I'm scared. I lost Kimani already, but I'm still scared. I have other boy children, and I'm worried about them. I'm afraid of their life. I'm afraid that these officers will never get the message because they always get away with the crime. Thank you very much. Aunt wanted to say a few words. Please welcome her. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I sat there quietly and I was listening to the members of the panel and um, you know I choose to come here to vent not only my anger but my frustration at you know what's going on in our community. I am even more ang angry and bitter when I look at the empty chairs in this audience today at, you know to see the lack of support in our committee I mean police brutality does not affect one of us it affects uh, all of us yes. and when it comes to our children being murdered I guess it's time to stand up I'm so angry that I have to think while I'm speaking because I look at it as like it's a redundancy it's like every time one of our kids get killed it's always the same old issue we go through the civil suits and we get what I call the shut up money okay it's about time that we change that and up the standard so that we can get some type of justice for these kids who are being murdered at an alarming rate Kimani was a sweet kid I don't care whether your child is a smooth criminal in suit or he's the most notorious criminal in the streets. They have rights, and these police are trained. Why are they using such excessive force? Seven bullets? Blatantly speaking, that should not be tolerated in our society. These cops need to be held accountable, and we need to get justice. We have to stand up and fight. Let's unite and fight. Thank you.